Um, hope everybody's doing well. I'm Carl Blackstone with the Columbia Chamber. We're thrilled to have you join us this morning. We've got a great, lively group. I think coffee's <laughs> been served for the last couple of hours, it sounds like. Uh, so let me just take a minute to, uh, to introduce this panel. I'll let them say a few words and we'll get into some Q&A. Just for housekeeping, uh, we've got a, a Q&A box uh, in uh, down below. So feel free to click on that if you wanna ask questions for any of our, our guests today. And um, it'll be open-ended, well, softball open-ended, right? Uh, but but um, we're gonna qu quit by nine o'clock because they've got a busy day of organizational stuff going on at State House. So. Uh, with that, welcome to the Chamber Issues Committee. Love to introduce uh, Representative Wendy Brawley. Uh, Wendy has been with us before. Many of y'all know Wendy, um, a longtime resident of Lower Richland and, and a big uh, advocate for this community. Uh, she represents District 70 out of officially Hopkins, mm -hmm. which I can't figure out because your next door neighbor in District 80, it goes from 70 to 80. Also from Hopkins is freshman representative Jermaine Johnson, uh, who is uh, gets officially sworn in this week. Um, so welcome, Jermaine. We're glad to have you with us. I'll get into more Jermaine in just a minute. And Representative Micah Kasky, across the river in uh, West <laughs> Columbia. Uh, Micah and I go way back, and uh, he's a treat to have with us today. So thank y'all both. Um, so to, as Y'all can see we wanted to focus on the South Carolina House of Representatives today and really um, just throw out some issues that are coming up. What y'all think are big topics that are coming up for this session. It's going to be such an interesting dynamics as we get through COVID. Uh, it's the first year of a two-year session. So all of y'all are sworn in this week, I guess, and serve uh, in this General Assembly. So with that, I'm going to start ladies first, if y'all don't mind. <laughs> Wendy, if would love for you to give some opening comments and then we can get into Q&A. Well, first of all, thank you, Carl, for the invitation. It's always good to be before this group. Uh, a little different this year because everything's virtual. Um, our lives have literally changed um, across the world, not just here. Uh, but this is an excellent opportunity just to share with you some of the things that I think are going to be priorities this year. Um, I cannot tell you that we will put anything before we deal with COVID. We've done a lot of that uh, with the funding that came through Congress with the CARES Act. But to be honest with you, everything in South Carolina hinges on whether or not we're able to successfully deal with COVID and its impact uh, on small businesses, large businesses, education, healthcare. I mean, it is all tied together. So that is going to be a major focus. But as you mentioned, there are so many other issues that we left undone. There's the Sandy Cooper issue. There is education reform. Uh, and of course, in the midst of all of that, we have redistricting because this is the year for that as well. So it's going to be a busy uh, cycle for us here in the General Assembly with lots of priorities, probably some that we don't even know because uh, at the beginning of last session, COVID was no place on our radar. But yet it has changed everything. Thank you. I, I, I was taking notes while you were talking because I would forgotten about some of those. How do you forget <laughs> redistricting? Uh, I know. <laughs> but that it, does take a, a huge issue. Um, have y'all, I know, Mike, y'all have y'all gone through redistricting before? <clears throat> no. Uh, I was first elected in 16, so uh, uh, obviously 2011 was the first time they, or the last time they did that. Y'all were in for it. Uh, hold on that thought. Let me introduce Jermaine. Jermaine, as I mentioned, represented uh, District 70. Uh, Jermaine is got one heck of a good degree down at, from the College of Charleston. Um, <laughs> and since then has, I'm sorry, I called you Jermaine. It's Dr. Jermaine Johnson, who has now gone on and got his PhD, but um, uh, played some hoops at College of Charleston and played in the NBA. And so uh, anyway, uh, he's going to lift the House uh, of representatives against North Carolina uh, for the next two years is what we <laughs> talked about. So anyway, Jermaine, welcome. Uh, how about a little bit about yourself and what your expectations are for this first session? 
Well, well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, you know, when, when uh, Carl called me, you always answer his phone calls when he calls you because it's got to be something. <laughs> You're lying. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, well, anyways, uh, I'm out of Lower Riston as well. Uh, my next door neighbor is my favorite rep, no offense, Micah, but my favorite rep, Wendy Brawley, <laughs> right next door to me. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm coming in here this year really just to to learn as much, but also to make the impact that I uh, that I, I plan to do for my constituents. Uh, my number one priority is definitely making sure that the broadband is being accessible to all of our constituents down there. Uh, I think uh, between uh, my two counties, uh, which Kershaw and uh, Richland, about 7,000 families that don't have access to broadband internet. You know, and we need to make sure that that is uh, fixed and addressed immediately, uh, especially in light of this COVID situation that's going on. Uh, we don't, you know, we have schools that are shutting down and opening back up and, you know, it, it's spiking at any time. Uh, so we need to make sure our children have access to educational opportunities and uh, that uh, the individuals that are in my rural community aren't left out. Uh, we know that, you know, uh, the city, they have access to all these different amenities, but we need to make sure that everybody has affordable and, uh, you know, accessible uh, opportunities for education. Great. Thank you. And last but not least, Mr. Kasky, uh, what's uh, this? So you've been. This is your fourth, fifth, starting your fifth year. Yeah. What, what do you think? Time flies when you're having fun. It really does. <laughs> I'm thinking, wow, that's flown by. Tell me about uh, what, what's your thoughts this session um, and, and the political realities that are going to happen this year. Oh, gosh. Um, well, first, thank you for the opportunity uh, to join you. Uh, this is one of my favorite things to do because uh, I frequently hear back from your members who, who've watched the panel. Uh, so that's that's always a treat. Uh, <laughs> um, no, this year, I, I'm, I'm really excited. Uh, you know, I, I would say um, it, there's a lot to learn in, in this job. You know, after you go from campaigning and saying all the things to make the world great and, and all that, like actually coming here and, and having to get down to brass tacks and actually pass legislation uh, is is a lot. And so I feel like uh, I've been able to learn a lot. I still learn uh, just an incredible amount each and every single day, both uh, on a substantive policy side and also uh, the mechanics of, of the political process. Uh, and, and to your question, I think um, you know by and large, and I'm happy to get to the, the individual issues in, in the next hour or so, but you know, I think you'll see the House largely look like it has in the past. Um, you know, the, our membership numbers are about the same. Um, I think uh, those initiatives and the, the efforts the House is undertaking will continue to address the real big issues with real good solutions. But the, the critical piece will be what do our friends in the Senate do, uh, if anything. Uh, obviously, they've had a, a change in the dynamics, uh, partisan dynamics over there. Uh, and to what extent will that possibly affect things and what will that uh, mean in terms of legislation that we can not just pass but then enact with the governor's signature so uh as a as a legislator i'm excited about it uh as a citizen i'm nervous about it uh so you know buckle up here we go yeah that's funny uh let, let's i mean the dynamics obviously jermaine is going to learn this as he gets over there uh this week but this is going to be a different session. I mean, I'm hearing a lot of committees are going to be virtual. Um, will session actually, will y'all be meeting regularly? I mean, what do you, I mean, Wendy, do you think how different is going to be? Uh, how does public input happen on a virtual platform? Um, uh, do you feel safe going back? Uh, let, me, let me throw that out. Well, you know, all those are good questions. Let me address the safety safety issue first. I, you know, I, I there there is a little unreadiness for me um, because the virus is spiking yet again, um, and we all know that we just came off of a big holiday, uh, and some people did the right thing, and probably others did not, and some people may have unknowingly done something that caused them to be exposed. But that's always a concern for for everybody. It should be we should be extra cautious here at the state capitol because we set the example of what should be happening out there in the broader communities. So I'm glad to see that we're taking some extra precautions by asking staff and members to wear masks. That has not always been the case. 
uh, since this virus started. And we are also providing hand sanitizer, PPE, um, just those kind of things. We are doing what we did previously when we were here back in June and also in September, we're limiting the number of people who will be able to be in the chamber. Of course, the press will still have access, but if you've ever been in the House chamber, it is close quarters with 124 members. So we're trying, I think the speaker is to be credited for that, trying to give us every opportunity to spread out. We've heretofore, um, I, you know, I served, and I'm sure um, Micah can say the same, on committees throughout this process. We I served on the education COVID committee that was created just to deal with COVID and education issues K through 12. And we met uh, physically. Um, we had the capacity to meet virtually, but you're right. It, it is very difficult for the public to weigh in on these topics when it's virtual. Because as Jermaine pointed out, should I say Dr. Johnson, <laughs> soon to be uh, representative Dr. Johnson uh, pointed out, not everyone has access to participate virtually. Um, my district and Dr. Johnson's district, they're both rural. We have lots of people who've never been connected. Um, there isn't anything there for them to connect to. So that's going to be a challenge for us. But I do think that we have to do the people's business. Um, we signed on to do this. So we have to be here to the extent that that's possible. But I hope as we move further into the process that we come up with ways where some of our meetings can be held virtually so that people aren't constantly being exposed. You know, we are close, we are in the Midlands, but you know, right. we've got colleagues that drive three and a half hours to get here. So we have to be, you know, sensitive to those kinds of things for them as well. Great, thank you. Um, Micah, for you, uh, thoughts on, on just the mechanics of coming back in session during, during COVID, uh, do you think it's gonna change much? Or y'all will y'all be in session most every week? I, I would I would think so. Uh, you know, I I would imagine that we'll be more deliberate about the way we do meet. Um, you know, we have a fine tradition here of gathering and achieving very little, and then applauding ourselves for having had worked very hard. Um, uh, my hope is that we will be uh, again more focused in how we spend our time together because there is. Uh, increased risk in, in gathering in an enclosed space with a, a large number of people as Wendy. The extra worry, uh, it just is. So um, I, I'm hopeful that our time will be, you know, purposeful and we won't uh, dilly dally too much. Um, I, I would expect that some committees will, will want to have more meetings, at least subcommittees would probably want to have more meetings virtually. Um, I'll say, though, that I think it's important to be in the room when uh, people are testifying, when people are speaking, because it, it's a different interaction, uh, uh, especially if there are witnesses testifying, just like in a courtroom. You know, you can do a motion hearing, uh, and I think you, you really, uh, the fidelity is good, but when you need to cross-examine a witness, you need to be in the room and you need to hear it. And so um, how we go about all that, you know, quite, quite honestly, I don't know yet. Uh, but I expect it'll be somewhat different um, just because, I mean, we, I think we just crossed a year since the first case in China uh, and, and wow, how, how, how much of a change have we seen? Um, quick question for anybody that's read a newspaper this morning. Two of our esteemed colleagues on this panel today were mentioned and I can't go without just throwing out there if anybody wants to comment on any, so we're having organizational meetings this week, at least the members of the House, both the R's and the D's are organizing this week. Any comments, maybe Wendy or Micah on anything going on? Well, <laughs> I love the way you did that. Uh, actually, you know, I am offering for minority leader. Um, and, you know, every now and then I think change is good. And um, as we face all these issues that we've never, some, some of us have never faced before. And I, I can think actually all of us, none of us have been in a pandemic. The last one of this caliber was in 1918. None of us were here. So I think, you know, as we recalibrate and we try to figure out as the minority caucus, the democratic caucus, um, how do we coalesce our members? 
how do we um, coalesce around certain issues that are relevant, not only in urban parts of our state, in metropolitan parts or suburban parts, but those, those issues that are affecting rural communities as well. Because if you're honest, most of South Carolina is rural. Absolutely. And we have to, con we cannot continue to leave them out and hope that our state is going to progress. Um, only until the next calamity or the next hurricane will we see the disparities and how great they are and how difficult they are economically to recover. So yes, I am offering uh, today, as a matter of fact, as minority leader, it is not that I have anything personally against our existing minority leader and my colleague from Richland, but it's just that I think we need a new direction and we need a new, um, I think a new purpose. And I think the only way sometimes we get that is that we change leadership. Right. Well, thanks for doing that. And sorry to throw you under the bus oh, like that. Oh, that's all right. Um, <laughs> I'm sure this afternoon. You softball there, Carl. You, you promised softball. <laughs> I know. Right. So much for the softballs, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and Mike has slumped in the chair. So I, I throw it back to him. No, I, I, Carl, I'm, I'm happy to answer that. Uh, you know, it's, di it's different uh, on our side uh, because our first challenge is, uh, so th again, this is the most inside baseball of inside baseball. This is the kind of <laughs> yeah. thing that only people who get up at eight o'clock to listen to a Zoom call about this uh, would ever find <laughs> remotely care. interesting. Um, on the Republican side, our, our caucus rules only allow uh, someone to serve uh, as majority leader for four years. Uh, Gary Semerl from Rock Hill has done that very ably. I have uh, absolutely no complaints about his leadership. I think he's represented our caucus well. Um, you know, I, I think he's struck the appropriate diplomatic tone and again, accredited himself uh, and the caucus very well. So, so uh, my interest in the role uh, really is, is more of a procedural one. Uh, insofar as we have rules, um, unless we change them, um, you know, we're gonna have an opportunity to elect someone new. Um, I suspect there will be a, a, a real effort to change those rules. Um, and we'll see how that shakes out. If, if the rules are changed and uh, Gary can serve four more years, then I'm, I'm all for Gary. Um, if, however, we don't change the rules, then I think this is an opportunity to bring, uh, you know, some of my experiences uh, to bear and, and to try and help the team uh, and help South Carolina. So. You know, it's, it's, it's not made up out of whole cloth. I, I would say, though, it's, it's probably less of a real uh, issue because I suspect we'll, we'll probably change rules. But if we don't, I, I do intend to, to offer for that position. Great. Well, thanks for the clarifying comments, both of you, on that. Now, Jermaine, as a rookie, you've been a rookie basketball player <laughs> on different <laughs> leagues. Uh, you've, you've seen challenges growing up in, in – LA and California, um, what's your biggest, going through and thinking about this is your first week as being an elected official, what challenges do you foresee? What do you hope to accomplish your first term? Um, and, and what are your goals for the next six months? Yeah, so with the COVID situation, it's, it's already, you know, presented so many uh, challenges for us freshmen. Um, you know, just coming in and trying to learn as much as we can, uh, but also not being able to include, you know, all of your family and friends for, you know, this, this special occasion. You've got individuals who are driving and some of our members are even missing uh, the organization this week because of COVID related situations. So, I mean, it's, it's presenting these, these troubling, you know, times for all of us uh, that are coming in. Here. So obviously there's going to be some barriers for us, you know, gaining all the knowledge in which we're trying to attain. And, uh, you know, we're going to have to do a lot of self-studying, a lot of self-researching, you know, a lot of things like that, spending time at home uh, and in our personal offices trying to get this information. Uh, you know, so it's, this is really going to separate, you know, the, the individuals who are really determined to, to be great legislators and the individuals who are just up here for a name. You know, so uh, individuals like myself, well, you know, I, I study all the time. So, you know, th this is what I'm determined to do. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I, you know, I, I talked to my constituents and, you know, I told them that I was going to come up here and I was going to work as hard as I could for them. And whatever that they wanted, that's what I was going up here to fight for. So I've even uh, told them, I said, hey, if y'all want a new uh, vending machine at the post office, then I'm going to fight for a new vending machine at the post office. You know, I, I'm just a, an extension of their voice. So, 
I'm just here to represent uh, the individuals, um, whatever they determine they want. Uh, we've talked about broadband. We've talked about education reform. We've talked about uh, infrastructure in, in the lower risk area. Uh, and if that's what my constituents want, then that's what I'm going to be working up there to get. And I know my, you know, my uh, intentions and my, um, you know, what I want uh, closely aligns with Representative Brawley. Uh, so we'll be working very closely on, you know, attaining some of these things for uh, our constituents because, you know, uh, some of my constituents have family members in her district. Some of hers have family members in my district. It's just a big old family <laughs> that <laughs> we're at. So, <laughs> so you know, I, it would just, I would be remiss. And, you know, if I did not work closely with my next door neighbor here uh, to make sure that we got what we needed down in the area. So uh, the, the, the biggest thing I want to do is learn everything that I possibly can learn. I want to suck up all the information that I possibly can suck up and not just from Democrats. I want to, I want to sit with people like Michael, you know, I want to sit down and I want to, I want to hear everything they have to say, even when he does talk trash about the college of Charleston or how I'm not a good <laughs> basketball player. I still, I still want to sit down with him <laughs> and have these conversations because it takes us working together to really get things done. And especially in times of COVID-19, we have got to work together. We've got to put these things aside. We have got to get down and work together to solve because when the elephants fight, it's the ground that suffers. So we need to get this thing together. Yeah, great. Um, all right, before I leave this, we've got a couple of questions. I do want to jump on those in just a second. But before, while he cracked the door, <laughs> Dr. Johnson did, Wendy and Micah, what's the one piece of advice you would give to a rookie as they start off their freshman year in the House of Representatives? Wendy? Well, you know, I think Dr. Johnson hit on it just right, and that is learn as much as you can, not just from your colleagues in the party that you are affiliated with, but from your colleagues in the opposite party. Um, there's a lot of maneuvering that takes place on the House floor um, that you can never really be fully prepared for because you never know who's voting for what and how that vote's going to go. So, uh, hold on, Wendy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. I um, I'm on my phone, so someone's calling. <laughs> uh. I I am of the opinion that once you try to learn in there, you won't learn it all you still got to do the most important work, which is represent your constituents, stay in contact with your constituents. Um, none of us up here can vote for you. Um, it's the people who are in your district that sent you here to represent them. And I think sometimes as people make alliances uh, and deals, they forget about that. They forget that the people who sent them here are back home and that we've got to always keep the line of communication opportunity um, open to the people that we represent, as well as position ourselves to try to move legislation um, through the House and the Senate. Right. Micah. Yeah, um, wow. I think Wendy really hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, it's really all about learning. I mean, it, it, this, this place is so uh, big. There's so much going on. You've got, you know, what you need to know about the, the black letter law, how this thing works, the, just the process, the, the, the rules, that stuff. And then you got the, the issues, the, you know, how do you actually, you can't just write a law that says be awesome. You gotta <laughs> learn and know substantively what it is that you're trying to fix. And then you got another whole bucket, which are the people um, and, and who is who and where are people sensitive to various things? Because a lot of things here are not like Washington. They're not partisan for, mo for the most part. Uh, I mean, the sexy issues, guns, abortion, those will be hard party votes. But so much of South Carolina tends to be, you know, urban versus rural or, or Charleston versus everybody. Um, and so appreciating that and, and just ask all the questions. I mean, there are no dumb questions and get to know and love Charles Reed, uh, the clerk of the house. Yeah. That, that's probably the bottom line. Just to go to Charles. He's got the answer. Uh, even if it doesn't, he'll have it for you. Listen, we're, we're, me and Charles, we're already uh, we're already here to hear on some things. He, he comes and hangs out of my district, so yeah, we're gonna be best buddies. Good, <laughs> good sage sage advice from these two. Uh, let's jump into a few questions we got on a couple of issues. Um, first one I got was um, from Kyle. Said we have new voting machines with paper ballot records, but the law does not allow the paper ballots to be verified. Can a mechanism for paper ballot verification be added to the law, specifically a process for a voter or candidate to request a full hand recount? 
Well, uh, I, I'm gonna throw that on on the judiciary yeah. committee member. <laughs> uh, candidly, I I don't know enough. Uh, I, I'd have to know more about the specifics. Um, I, I will say, and this is sort of uh, shades towards uh, advice. Uh, it, it's best not to get over your skis. You know, when you don't know, just just acknowledge that. Uh, and, and I don't know enough about that specific process. Um, in, in theory, uh, I, I don't see why we can't explore that, but I don't know the specifics to, to give you a definitive answer. But that's a great question. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I would agree with that. This is really the first major election cycle that we've used the machines, the new machines. Um, I think ultimately they performed very well. People seem to be um, pleased with being able to get at least a printout to see what their their vote looked like before they actually inserted it into the counter, if you will, to register the vote. But, um, you know, we did a recount, I think, in Richland County, and it went well, but I'm going to have to defer to Michael as well, Micah as well. I'm not familiar with specifically what he, the questioner, is asking in terms of what they would like to have. But certainly we wanna make sure the process is as open and transparent as possible. And if there is something that we need to do, I'm sure that we are open to looking at that. And I'm sure Michael would agree with that. Jermaine, you got anything to add there? Absolutely not. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, let, let's talk about one of the, I, I know y'all are not on, on the budget committee, but as we obviously budget is going to be a big deal this year. Uh, I know the BEA has lowered the forecast for next year, still anticipating a surplus uh, to some degree, but y'all hits on a lot of things this summer when you came back, uh, broadband was one and deploying those uh, different solutions for kids all over South Carolina, because I do think Broadband is one of the hot topic issues that got to be solved. I think that's the great equalizer in this 21st century. Um, what are the priorities do you see coming out of? I, I know what folks really want, uh, which is everything, but, but you have a smaller surplus. Where do you think we'll end up uh, from a budgetary standpoint? And, and uh, I know education broadband, we've all touched on that. Other issues that you think are going to take a lot of the money, I mean, universities have been really struggling with COVID and the cost of uh, making the university safe. They're going to ask for a lot of money. Jermaine, do you have any thoughts on, on where you think you're going to see the money go? Yeah, well, you know, we, we have got to do priority stuff first. And I, I think we need to make sure we're helping some of these uh, small businesses in the rural communities. Um, so uh, if there's any type of programs we can do for small business in these communities, we need to explore those options because these rural communities are the ones that are suffering the most. Uh, we already touched on how they don't have the, uh, the broadband, but also they're lacking health care, uh, you know, location. Then we have a lot of teachers that don't even want to, you know, teach in these rural communities. You know, we have people like that. So... Uh, and then so when you don't have people coming to these areas, then you then the small business suffer. So, you know, we need to do something to help bail out, you know, uh, some of these small businesses, uh, some of these rural communities. I know uh, East Over definitely needs some assistance down there. Uh, I've already talked to uh, Mayor Gunter about helping him out uh, with some things going on down there. So, you know, we need to make sure that, that a lot of that money is going to these rural communities, these small communities that have, you know, so often been left out. Yeah. Um, if I, if I yeah. could, I'm, I'm happy to to take a first whack at that, because uh, it's a complicated question. Um, to the extent that we, we have a surplus, uh, or at least more revenue in the state's coffers than last year, I, I think our first priority has got to be to uh, rectify what we did with teachers uh, in terms of uh, the, the step increase freeze. Um, I think we've got to honor that commitment first. Um, and then we open the door to which of the everythings can we solve? Um, but to be able to do that, we have to recognize that, you know, our, our state government uh, is, is downhill from commercial activity, private activity, right? We, we fund state government through taxes. And if uh, businesses aren't making money, if individuals aren't making money, uh, you know, th that's uh, state revenues are derivative of, of income taxes and property taxes and fines, fees. So if, if the commercial side, because of, uh, 
COVID is depressed everything so much, we're going to have less to work with here. And uh, that's a long-winded way of getting to the point of saying that one of the most important things that I think we can do in, uh, in the legislature is uh, demand that our state agencies um, look real hard internally at how they can tighten their belts in, in terms of improving processes and, and, and developing greater efficiencies with what they do, because the resources aren't going to be what they, we thought they were going to be a year ago. Um, and in the short run, you know, we can make promises to different people, but um, first thing we've got to do is we've got to get better um, because we do have challenges across the state, um, as, as my colleagues have rightly said. So um, you know, where we prioritize the money, uh, those conversations will be had as uh, Ways and Means subcommittees start meeting, uh, I think probably next week, um, to start developing that. Um, and of course, we'll, we'll be waiting on the BEA's latest analysis uh, all while hoping that people will start getting the message with regard to COVID and doing what they can to, to help slow the spread of this disease until we can get the vaccine out. Mm. Wendy? Well, I, I would agree with um, both of what my colleagues are saying. Um, first of all, we made a serious promise to educators um, that we didn't get to deliver on. So I do think we need to, we need to handle that. Um, I think one of the things that COVID has, has shown us is that when our school systems, our public school systems are not fully operational, everything is impacted. Jobs are impacted. Uh, parents can't go to work. Uh, kids aren't learning, they're falling behind. Uh, and when parents can't go to work, small businesses and large businesses suffer. So I think, you know, fulfilling the promise that we made to our teachers um, is, in my opinion, that's tantamount. And I think we also have to look at, continue at the, at the same time to look at how we fund education. I mean, we, we, we started having this conversation before and we, we get in a crisis and we kind of just back away from it, but we need to look at how we fund education. And um, the elephant in the room is that act, <laughs> 388, that actually changed everything. And so at some point, I think legislatively, we have to address that and balance the scale more so for funding of education and government. With any funds that we have left, I would like to see us look at, you know, providing some help to the, to the local governments because they are really suffering, particularly the local rural areas. Their, their incomes, their revenue has, has dramatically decreased because people aren't working. They're not able to pay their taxes. They're not even able to pay their water bill. And most of the time, those bills are, you know, something that's paid to the local government. So you have a situation where there are issues of sustenance, water, food, housing that are being impacted because of COVID. And I think if we're serious about trying to address our priorities, we really need to make certain that with any money that, that we have, we are reinvesting in fixing those areas so that the, the, the small communities across our state don't die on the vine because they don't have people who are able to work. So in 2006, when we when the bill was passed to uh, Act 388 passed, mm -hmm. the unbelievable amount of unintended consequences came out of that uh, bill and that that no one really could have foreseen or at least the extent of the, the number of unintended consequences. Do we agree that in the first year of a two-year session, and especially during this year, that that's untouchable? I mean, I, I would love to see some changes made to 388, but I think I, I just don't feel the energy there. Micah? Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. It's uh, because of the way 388 functions, you're touching so many uh, energized constituencies um, I mean, you're talking about uh, the business community, residential property owners, uh, and all of this touching education, uh, which if uh, our abbreviated session last year, well, I guess the year before, uh, was any indicator, um, everybody gets highly energized about that. And so uh, because of that, you can develop whatever narrative you want. And until there's a, uh, a real viable alternative around which uh, consensus has developed, um, that means long and arduous debate that um, unfortunately 
in a year where there are real imperatives to, to be solved uh, from redistricting all the way down or all the way through, uh, I, I just don't see it as a, as a political reality uh, that one should expect. Um, yeah, we, we, we could all agree that it should be done. Um, I, I just, I just, I, I mean, I just try to be honest. I don't, I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah, I, I think you have little conversations about it, but, you know, it's probably not going to be the biggest thing. But I can tell you that the individuals out of Kershaw County have been calling me and saying that that is their main thing, is that Act 388 and how it has decimated them in Kershaw. So, uh, you know, th that is definitely, you know, uh, something that I would like to tackle uh, eventually. Uh, but, you know, I can definitely agree with you, Mike, in saying that, you know, this just because of the, the hectic stuff that we're in right now and redistricting and everything like, you know, some of our members may not even be there, <laughs> you know, so after redistricting. <laughs> so we have to make sure that we're, you know, uh, we're prioritizing where we're at. Right. Um, let me switch. We have a Vicki uh, sent in a question. Will priority be given to other health or health care related issues beyond COVID? If so, what issue do the panelists foresee? Wendy? Well, unfortunately for South Carolina, we are probably one of the sickest states in the nation in terms of chronic illnesses like diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, certain cancers. So, you know, pick an illness and we're there. Um, but I would like to see, I, this is just me personally, us dedicate some more emphasis to mental health. Um, I think given where we are, given what we've gone through as a state, what we've gone through nationwide and across the world with COVID, um, the mental health issues are really manifesting themselves in so many different ways among our children, uh, among adults, um, in crime areas. We're seeing rises in crime and violent crime. Um, so I would like to see us at least acknowledge the fact that mental health is a serious illness that deserves a priority consideration, particularly as we work our way back to some degree of normalcy after COVID. But there are many other there are many other health issues in my area, to be honest with you, in the rural area. It's just trying to get a doctor, you know, trying to have a primary care physician located within a 10 mile radius of where you are. That is a concern. So, you know, there are many health issues that I know that we won't be able to solve financially. A lot of it, it is it's going to be some personal responsibility on the part of all of us to eat right, to do more exercise and all the things that we know to keep us healthy. But, you know, making sure that we address the mental health crisis that we're seeing across our state that's manifesting itself through more drug addiction, suicides, murders, violent crime, children that are runaways. We need to really focus our attention on some of those issues as well. We got a couple of other issues that are coming in. But before we leave the topic and what we talked about schools and I think mental health, health issues are going to be exacerbated over the next few years. There's no question because of COVID. But partly in the, in the adolescent kids, uh, we've seen a spike in, um, in mental health cases. A lot, could it be because of schools and not being uh, socialized in school, which all support a statewide mandate required kids to go back five days? Hmm. Jermaine? Trying to, uh, trying to unmute it. No. A statewide mandate for schools go back five days. I, I don't think we can uh, we can do that. Uh, and the main reason is because our communities are so are so different. Uh, some communities uh, have the resources to put up the different things in their schools, and some other communities don't have that. You know, so we, we don't want to make uh, uh, you know children suffer because their communities are, are are you know less resourceful as the other ones. You know, so you know I think that is a, a district decision. Uh, I think each district, we need to make sure that we have the right uh, leaders in our districts to make those decisions and to uh, better prepare uh, for the students to return to school. Uh, right now, we just can't do that uh, because, you know, like I said, it'll be the it'll be the, the poor kids in the poor areas that are gonna be the ones that are suffering the most. Like we talked about, you know, different communities where you throw in uh, pollution and, and bad drinking water and things like that. You know, those kids are gonna be the ones that suffer, you know, not the ones that are in the, 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 the private schools and, you know, the different areas. So uh, I don't think that's the right decision. I think it needs to be a district city. Okay. Bro, I'll, I'll say that uh, I, I think one of the lessons of our, our state pension fund is that uh, we shouldn't prescribe 
reality. We should observe reality. And, and by that, I mean, uh, we shouldn't just say this is going to be the rate of return on our investments as a political decision. We should see what happens as a, as a real world, uh, as the real world market interplays there. Uh, and, and, you know, by analogy, I, I say the same with, with schools. Um, look, conditions are changing. We can't just say, well, the conditions will be fine enough that all 46 counties can have five day school all the time. Uh, that, that is so. Uh, uh, we have a tendency to do that here sometimes in the legislature. And I think that's the wrong tact. Uh, just as recently as this morning, there's an article in the state paper that uh, over in Lexington, Richland five, uh, you know, there, there's a fear that they may have a teacher shortage. And, and there you're talking about you know, uh, if not the, the top capitalized school district in the state, it's certainly in the top three. Um, you know, re resources there are, are virtually limits, limitless, or at least relatively limitless uh, compared to what uh, some people are uh, having to deal with. So, I, you know, a statewide uh, mandate, I, I don't think that makes sense um, right now, again, because we, we need to look at where conditions are. And, and the fact is, uh, as we used to say in the Marines, uh, you know, the enemy gets a vote. And so uh, COVID has a vote. And uh, until that is uh, no longer a threat, we have to be able to retain the ability uh, to be dynamic in our response. Uh, I would agree. Um, I would not support a statewide mandate to send all kids back to school for um, five days a week because I don't think the situation in these areas are all alike. You have some places in the state where the virus is spiking fairly out of control. Um, and then you have other places where it's not as bad. I, I will say this, I think all of us support and believe that children need to be in school. I mean, that is not the issue. It's just how do we get them there safely? And how do we protect not only the children who we know at least scientists are telling us probably will be less impacted health-wise by the virus, but how do we protect the teachers, the bus drivers, the cafeteria workers, the principals, the administrative staff, all of the people who are a part of the education system? We have to, we cannot make these broad based rules and just totally disregard, like you said, Michael, the reality of what's happening all around us. Mm -hmm. And I think um, to Jermaine's point, the school districts are in a better position to make that decision. They were elected to do that to look out for, for what's happening in their districts and figure out how best to get those students, all of their students back into a five day work, a five day week, so that obviously their parents can go to work, but their parents shouldn't be driving, the, the idea of you know, fixing the economy should not be driving whether or not we're sacrificing safety of our students, our faculty, staff, and teachers. So I, I think that I would like to see us provide as much help guidance as we can, let that be as consistent as we can across our state, um, but not mandate that, that, that kids have to be back in school five days because we're not in a position, I don't think, legislatively to do that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's go back to softballs, okay? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and, and Wendy brought this up as a, I think, a soft, uh, Santee Cooper. Um, That's a softball? <laughs> I'm kidding. Go ahead. Yeah. Thoughts on, I mean, it, 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 it takes two bodies, a house in the Senate, obviously, and, and nobody can predict what the other body is going to do. But uh, I, 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 Wendy brought this up as one of the big topics, I think, for the, for the year. And actually, I agree with you. Thoughts on, uh, or do you have an opinion yet on Santee Cooper? Uh, anyone? Well, since I brought it up, yeah, I guess I'll uh, take a tackle it first. Um, yeah. There are some people uh, on both sides of the aisle who feel you know, opposite in terms of what should be done. There are lots of people who believe that it should be sold. The governor is proposing that it be sold. Um, but then there are people who, who feel very strongly that it should not be. I'll tell you where I fall at, at the moment. And that may change as, as more is uncovered. But we, as a state, if we do sell Santee Cooper, what we have, will have done is basically given to an out of state source all essentially all of our ability to provide power because Dominion is not a domestic company and neither are some of the companies who have expressed an interest in purchasing Santee Cooper. We are seeing climate control just, in, just change every season. It becomes a little bit more of a challenge as to what we are having to face. I personally don't think it's wise 
to cede all of our power resources to out-of-state companies. I think that having some ability to make certain that South Carolinians are taken care of by an entity that has some connection with South Carolina because it's domiciled here or it's, it's governed and regulated in a way that makes its ownership here um, is to our advantage because I, I don't think that we will be served best in the long run if all of our electrical power and sources are coming from um, out-of-state sources. Mm -hmm. That's just me. Okay. Um, uh, I, I agree. I'll, I'll, <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll say I don't agree. Uh, necessarily. I kind of uh, thought you would. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I don't see autarky as our, as our primary goal. Look, my analysis really turns on, on this point, which is that under our current uh, electrification paradigm, what we have is geographic monopolies. Right, where you live, you don't get a choice on who your power provider is going to be. And, and as such, um, until we get away from that model, and, and believe you me, that is not on the horizon, despite what Senator Davis may want, um, we've got to acknowledge that reality. And, and I think it's best to look at it like we would a tax. Um, you know, uh, I understand that some people can't afford electricity, but for those of us who, who do pay electric bills, there's, there's, wait, there we go. There's very little that, you can change in terms of your electric consumption. It's, it's an inelastic demand for the most part. Um, and that makes it look a lot like a tax. Uh, if you can't choose and you can't change, uh, that's a lot like a tax. And so what I think we have a responsibility to do um, once we get over a certain threshold in terms of reliability, uh, we've got to ensure that we get the lowest uh, cost, the lowest price for uh, South Carolinians. And so I think that's where uh, my focus would be in, in terms of evaluating opportunities. Um, that is complicated by the fact that Santee Cooper's leadership has a, uh, a penchant for mendacity. We'll, we'll say that. Uh, they've, they've had a long trouble uh, with, with their ability to communicate clearly to uh, at least our body. So, um, you know, I, I will look forward to that debate uh, as we go down the road. But to me, it's all about how do we get prices as low as they can be for the individual South Carolinian? Jermaine, I want to let you close that out. Yeah, well, well uh, I, I err on the side of, of Wendy. I just don't believe that, you know, it would be smart to give away uh, something that we're producing right here at home. I mean, it just doesn't, it, for, for me, it's just not a, a sound uh, investment or a sound judgment call, you know. Uh, but also we need to look at other uh, alternative uh, methods, and that is, you know, uh, doing more investment in our renewable energy. You know, when we do stuff like that, we can get more away from, you know, this situation. I mean, can you imagine if, you know, we took the caps off the the, the solar consumption and, and how much people can get uh, get paid back uh, for producing power? I've looked at a lot of things for uh, the Hopkins area for uh, creating community solar, you know, things like that, because we have a lot of seniors who can't afford these, these high prices that we're talking about. So, you know, we need to look at all these options. Um, I, again, I don't think it's the right decision to, to sell something that we're producing right here. We just need to make sure we're tightened up on the regulations and making sure things are affordable for, the, uh, for, the, uh, for all of our constituents. Great. All right. And I might add, before we leave that discussion, um, no shade on Dominion, but the first thing Dominion is doing is trying to raise rates in the midst of a pandemic. So, um, you know, we have to be very cautious when we talk about lowering rates because just because a company can come in and buy it what's to prevent the next that company from selling it to another company and another company and, and another and company. Mm -hmm. we no longer would own that opportunity to control that okay all right well i brought that on only because you brought that up uh wendy earlier okay <laughs> softballs right um all right so we talked about there are a couple i'm trying to balance between going back to the chat and the questions. Um, I think we've hit broadband. I think everybody's supportive of broadband and, and the need. And that should get, if, if Congress acts appropriately, if, uh, but I, I think we've got some federal dollars that could help uh, institute broadband across the state, which would add significant value to the education as well as telehealth opportunities uh, across the state. I, I don't suspect anybody challenges that or different, okay, so we're good there. Um, 
Tom Ledbetter brought up a couple of things. One, we talked about state budget. Uh, infrastructure. I, I know with the, the two cents per gallon every year for six years, we're in the halfway through that process now of, of adding money. Uh, you know, we're, this is, it goes back to, we talked to rural and urban. Um, and where is that money going? Uh, do you think it's the right plan? Obviously, our interstates need significant uh, upgrades as well. Thoughts on infrastructure uh, and as we go through this year? Well, um, <laughs> for people in rural communities like mine, um, we're fighting for things like, can we get our potholes fixed? <laughs> can They're tearing up our tires. They're, 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 they're doing serious damage to our cars. We don't have the money for the repairs. We're paying this extra money on the gas. Why, why can't we get some of the money that we see going in other places? Why can't we get a traffic light? Why can't we get ditches cleaned that are in um, state right of ways? Uh, these are still questions that are being asked of me every day in rural communities. And couple that with in Richland, we have a road tax. We have a special tax uh, that we pay on every car every year um, to help with specifically with roads. So I think people are taxed out um, and they are ready to see those dollars more equitably distributed. Uh, I know that we have a list of high priorities and our roads and bridges, our highways are important, um, but we cannot continue to leave out those rural roads, those farm to market roads um, that allow people to get to back and forth to work um, and allow them to safely, you know, get kids back and forth to school. Um, many of them still not really seeing any benefit uh, from the taxes that they're paying. And, and to be honest with you, and I say this to my, my constituents all the time, my, my constituents buy more gas than anybody because they live farther away from everything. So they are, they are really um, supporting in a large degree the gas tax and seeing perhaps the least amount of return. And that, that the equitable distribution of that money really does need to be looked into by the General Assembly. And I, I'm gonna uh, echo those sentiments only because, so you, you may see my car at the State House today riding on a donut. And why it's on a donut is because a pothole cracked my rim. So it's actually in the shop right now getting fixed. Uh, and, you know, so it's not that, you know, just everybody, we're all going through this situation. So we have definitely have to take a look at fixing these situations, coming up with a better solution as to how to equitably fund the infrastructure that's going on. Because, you know, the individuals who are in my community, uh, they're going through these things, myself included. And, you know, you got to think, you know, when, when there's not a lot of things in your rural community, let's say you crack your rim, you get to the house. I mean, you have, it's so difficult just to get those things uh, repaired. You've got to drive so far just to get somewhere. You've got to go all the different places. I mean, they're living, you know, 10 miles from, from anything, you know? So we've got to make sure that we, you know, take a real hard look at this infrastructure and the way it's funded so that we make sure that everybody gets the most bang for their buck that they're paying in there. Representative Cass. I'll just say very briefly, uh, I agree with those concerns. I, I think they're real. Uh, you know, I think Partly it's a function of poor communication on the part of the department to highlight what efforts they have undertaken and where their achievements are. But at the end of the day, when you look and you see bridges being built to Kiowa and uh, interchanges being built, uh, non-prioritized interchanges built, being built in York County uh, to go to a practice field, uh, it's frustrating. So uh, I, I understand, uh, I share those concerns. And, and it's interesting, COVID has done a couple of things. One, highlighted the need for rural broadband, and that's, that's been a big one. The other thing it's done is highlighted the growth in Southern states, and, and we have seen significant gains um, month over month from last year in uh, new home sales, uh, new construction for homes, uh, uh, prices of real estate going through the roof all over South Carolina from the mountains to the coast which means more people are coming into South Carolina than ever before at a faster rate, which means uh, a significant impact on infrastructure. So I'll throw this one last, it, are we good with, is it the amount of money that needs to go to infrastructure or the allocation of the, uh, 
the money's fine. We just need to reallocate it. What, what's your thoughts? I'll, I'll go backward, Micah. Yeah, I, I'll give you one quick example. Um, here in, in Lexington County, uh, the I-20 expansion project, it's about $103, $104 million. Uh, that project was delayed in terms of completion uh, by nine, 10 months uh, because the, uh, the quality control process broke down. Uh, I'll spare you the details, but effectively they didn't catch the fact that the uh, engineers had not calculated the need for additional fill to build the outside lane. And the result uh, was that they had to go back and rebuild that section. Uh, I think we could have been smarter about our internal QA, QC processes uh, and delivered a better project on time uh, instead of adding to the frustration uh, that so many feel as they try and transit uh, west to east or east to west across uh, the very center of our state. Um, I, so I don't think that's a resource question. I think that is a, uh, a leadership function. Uh, and we, we fell short of the mark there. Uh, and I have a hard time believing that that kind of mistake is limited to that one project. Um, I, I think that's an institutional concern that uh, should be addressed. Um, and, and I'm hopeful that uh, our friends in the executive branch will, will find a way to, uh, to deliver a, a better, better result in the future. Great. How's that for diplomatic? <laughs> I duly noted, Wendy. Well, I think it is not so much uh, uh, the appropriation or the, or the revenue available as much as it is the allocation. I think we really need to, um, even as legislators, I think we, members of the legislature, we need to know more about how these funds are being allocated. Um, and we need to insist that there is a greater degree of equity. Um, we know that we've got a lot of big projects that need to be fixed because we have for two decades not done what we were supposed to do. And so we're in a hole and we're trying to dig our way out of the hole, but it should not always be at the expense of rural communities. And there on the priority list, you know, I am often told when I contact uh, DOT about issues about roads, but we look at how many cars travel that road. Well, we will never in a rural community have the number of cars that travel our road that you could compare to I-26. That's just, that's not, a, that's apples to oranges, but you have to allocate those funds more equitably in a way that says that rural communities are a part of our infrastructure and people need to be able to travel those roads safely as well. Correct, thank you. Last word, Jermaine. Uh, absolutely, I think it's uh, allocation and uh, prioritizing. Uh, which things need to be done. Um, you know, we like to we like to take care of Charleston and Greenville and you know those, those big those big hubs there. Uh, but you know, we're not looking at the at the you know the down in the rural communities to make sure that they are having their needs met. I mean, we're doing we're dealing with a lot of the same situations uh, that you know the big cities are dealing with as well. Uh, so we cannot you know continue to leave them out. Uh, we have people that are that are uh, traveling these roads. You know, uh, we have these two lane highways, and people are, you know, we're backed up with traffic, and we have all these different situations in these in the in our rural community. So uh, we need to make sure that we are uh, prioritized on this list, but also, you know, do it with with a scale. You know, let's scale it uh, the the same way. You know, what's the population density based on you know uh, how many people are traveling this road, and and scale it up to if it would be the same as a Charleston or a Greenville, and let's do it that way. You know, so there's different options and opportunities that we can look at, but it has to absolutely, uh, it, it cannot be at the expense of the, the rural community. All right. Well, listen, we, I hate to leave it there, but we're going to have to today. Y'all got a busy day ahead of you. Uh, I, I really thank y'all for taking the time to be with us. We, the chamber appreciates, one, your service to the state and your communities, but two, being friends of ours and, and being willing to get up early to, uh, to join us. So good luck today. Um, Thank you. And, and, and as you're organizing, and let us know how we can help you all. But we always appreciate you. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. You guys yeah. take care. Thank you so much. Take Listen, care. Y'all have a good day. We'll see you soon. You too. Absolutely. Thank you.